Paula Villa, ich freue mich sehr, die Veranstaltung jetzt hier mit dem Toronto zu moderieren. Ich heiße Sie und euch alle sehr willkommen zu dem Vortrag äh, heute früh. Ich werde die äh, äh, Kollegin John Toronto kurz vorstellen, in English, uh, and then we'll get started with the talk. And if we have time, there will be a Q&A, very brief round of questions, but the keynotes are set in a way that they are mainly the presentation, and we have plenty of time and opportunity for ongoing debate and discussion in all the other formats, and I'm very glad and honored that Dawn will be around for a few days, so I'm sure she'll be more than interested in talking to all of us on all of these issues. So, Joan Toronto, of course, is very well known, uh, not only, but especially to within the field of care, capitalism, care work, gender, and the intersection of these issues, and of course, uh, with a framing, an overall framing, the issue of ethics. She is Professor Emerita of Political Science at the University of Minnesota and City University of New York in the US, uh, where she uh, served long years as Professor of Political Science. Uh, she's been uh, an invited academic scholar at, and among others, I'm just going to list a few, Montevideo and Uruguay, Bern, Paris, Paris, Bologna, Göttingen, Princeton, Wien, Frankfurt, Utrecht. And she holds uh, Ehrendoktor Honoris Causa at the University of Utrecht. Her main work, of course, uh, is Care as a Political Concept, and that's one, uh, that's the title of one of her early works, or one of her works from 96. She's been working a lot, publishing very widely, researching into the feminist ethics of care as political theory. Um, I'll just name a few titles you probably will be familiar with. One is from 1993, Moral Boundaries, a Political Argument for an Ethic of Care. Then, probably one of her most known books and something she'll be talking about today is Caring Democracy, Markets, Justice, and Equality, published by New York University Press in 2013. And then a follow-up, maybe, or continuing this issue, the book um, by Cornell Press, Who Cares How to Reshape a Democratic Politics. In German, there are two articles I'd like to mention. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with her work, you might want to look into them. Um, Demokratie als fürsorgliche Praxis um, in den feministischen Studien, eine Ausgabe 2017. Und auch 2017 in das Argument, um, kann sorgende Demokratie eine politische Theorie der Transformation sein? Frage. I'm very honored and pleased to welcome you, Joan. Very um, uh, thankful you've made it and come uh, to us. We met in Toronto um, in July, and I all encourage you as well, that's why I'm mentioning it, to look into you. There's a great network uh, of scholars working on um, care work and care issues and gender, and they organize Care Summit, and that's where we met, and we share an interest in care and neo-authoritarian or populist or fundamentalist political mobiliza mobilizations and how care uh, is an issue within these new maybe political um, formations. So that's what we're going to maybe also be talking about today. So the floor is yours to talk to us on the future of caring democracy. Thank you. Good morning. It's too middle. I cannot speak German, so you'll forgive me. I want to begin by thanking the conference organizers for inviting me. I feel humbled and honored to be able to address this particular conference, speaking about the future. We social scientists spend a lot of time thinking about the past, but we rarely think about what's coming ahead. I also want to thank the people who have been organizing the staff work for this conference, because without them, of course, conferences don't happen. But uh, we rarely acknowledge the work they do, so I want to thank them all for taking care of me, getting stupid person here in front of you today. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. 
Now to advance the slides, we need to use one of these buttons. That one. No, not that one. Okay, it wasn't just me. There it is. This one? Got it. Thank you. You know, I just picked up a clean copy. As I was preparing this talk, I picked up a brand new copy of The Great Transformation and started on page one and read it as if I were an undergraduate who'd never run into this text before. And I have to tell you, the end is disappointing. <laughs> okay, it was 1944, and you can't really expect him to be too optimistic. But he's extremely pessimistic, in fact, I think, in this text. In the final pages, in the final chapter, there's a very weird chapter, because most of it has been economic history. And then suddenly there is this little couple of pages about the moral and religious meaning of liberty. And it seems as if someone else has written this. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit at all. And so I began to think about, well, why is his account of freedom so off in space and it has nothing to do with the realities of human life? Well, okay, you know, you know what? It, it's almost the Jewish holidays, the high holy days, so this put me in mind of Moses, who never made it to the promised land. And you know what? Polanyi was born 75 years too early. Because if he were alive today, he would say, you know who's helping us with freedom? Feminists. They've figured out a way to think about liberty in a way that is concrete. And in a way, that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, this morning. Well, there we go. So in 2013, I published Caring Democracy. It was actually written in 2010. It just took a long time to come to print. And it was a, you know, it's interesting. It's not yet a decade ago, but it was a different time. The book argued that, first, that neoliberal economic practices were disastrous for the everyday care of people, and they left everyone at the mercy of economic inequality. Second, that the next phase of the great democratic revolution is to rethink democracy from the perspective of care. Let me put it slightly differently. Every time the franchise has been expanded, a new group of people have been included, they've brought with them new sets of concerns. So at the turn of the 19th century, as working class people, sorry, the turn of the 20th century, as working class people all over the world became part of the electorate, so too, questions about workers' conditions, not that these are solved, um, pensions began to become questions that were politically important. The enfranchisement of women through the 20th century brought with women into the electorate. But the question of what to do about the unpaid work and the work that women mostly do in the household and how that might be organized politically has not yet been fully realized. And to me, that's the next phase of this democratic revolution brought by women, not exclusively for women, but it's going to require that we, th we rethink the nature of democracy. And then I finally argued that democracy, in fact, when we get that far down the line, we need to think about the fact that everything that we do in our lives is touched by the political realm and so democracy can best be considered as a way to allocate caring responsibilities in a society and to make certain that everyone has voice to participate in that allocation, reorganizing caring responsibilities through a more democratic practice of understanding and redistributing responsibilities for care. And that is how democracy should now proceed. So we need to think about democracy not from the standpoint of the political economy, but from the standpoint of care. The overall argument of the talk this afternoon is to argue, is to see an, that the ongoing strength of the free market ideology is in fact a question of care. 
Every ideology contains within it a theory about how care should get done. No less true of the free market than of care and democracy or of, frankly, slave-owned societies which have their own view of what should be the way to care. Now, Polanyi, I think, here was wrong because the free market did not disappear but constitutes the contemporary political order and I'm going to call it wealth care. That's the first part of the paper. In the second part, I want to talk about wealth care giving rise to the neo-populist threats to democracy and to the fascist politics that we now see around us. Thirdly, I shall argue that a key to escaping from this moment is to return to another one of Polanyi's suggestive but underdeveloped ideas, and that is the centrality of responsibility. And fourth, that caring democracy provides a way to reground the concerns of responsibility and to redirect wealth care to make it easier for people to cope with responsibility. So those are the four sections of the paper. Let's start first by talking about wealth care. Okay, so no one uses this language, I just made the term up, but I think it's actually useful because it immediately tells us something important, and that is, what is it that we care about? Well, in our culture, what we care about aren't people, isn't the environment, isn't the earth, it's wealth. Now, Polanyi, you remember, had said um, towards the end of the text that the utopian free market is gone. But uh, of course, it isn't. He, write, he wrote that economic history reveals that the emergence of the national markets was in no way spontaneous. It was guided by governments who imposed the market organization on society for non-economic ends. The congenital weakness, he says, of 19th century society was not that it was industrial, but that it was a market society. Industrial civilization, he continues, will continue to exist when the utopian experiment of the self-rating market will be no more than a memory. The utopian experiment of the self-regulating market will be no more than a memory. Boy, that's not so. Don't we wish it were, but it isn't. So, on the one hand, Blanyi sees the destruction that arose out of the attempt to create a utopian free market as being already behind us, and I, I'm quoting the text here. In the dislocation of our age, in the tragic vicissitudes of the depression, fluctuations of currency, mass unemployment, shifting of social status, spectacular destruction of historical states, we have experienced already, he says, the worst. Now, he was wrong. We have relived this again in some important ways. On the other hand, he presciently shows how fascism arises out of fear, and among those fears is the fear of rate of change being too great. Neoliberalism, now the emergence of market fundamentalism, is now the dominant economic order. Again, quoting, the economic system in which government expenditures are limited, the market is viewed as the preferred method for allocating all social resources, or I should say this is my definition of neoliberalism. The protection of private property is taken to be the first principle of government, and social programs are limited to being a safety net. So here we are, and it seems to me useful for us to think about neoliberalism now slightly differently and to use a care lens to understand it as a form of wealth care. Previously I argued, and you probably know this, that I argued that in neoliberalism, care itself occurs in the private, for the self, and for the family. You remember famously Margaret Thatcher saying, there is no such thing as society. And as I reread um, Polanyi, I thought, oh, that's where she got it from because he makes the claim that there's an opposition between market and society. But that's only half the story, I think, now. I mean, it's true, that's their view of care, but I think it's only half the story. Um, in 1982, Harry Frankfurt, a philosopher, wrote a little essay called The Importance of What We Care About. 
And it's kind of a funny little philosophical essay, but there's something important in saying what we care about is who we are. Yeah? And what we care about in wealth care systems is about wealth and its accumulation. Now, wealth has a remarkable capacity to protect itself. Think about it for a moment. Now, think not about the society as organized about people, but think of the society as organized by a bunch of really rich people whose goal isn't even to make themselves happier, because you know they already own everything they need, but the goal is for them to make their wealth happier. I know, it's a little switch, but that's what's really going on here. Jeffrey Winters, in his book, Oligarchy, talked about the material way in which this happens in what he calls the income defense industry. The number of people in the United States who spend, who spend their careers making sure that wealth is protected has gone up dramatically. The financial sector has exploded. It's no longer enough for someone to work, to earn a living in order for them to um, live well. Now they need to have financial institutions um, back up in order for them to live well. Um, television commercials in the United States frequently say to people, if, it basically say, if you are working, the chances are the rich person's dog is living better than you are. It's time for you to start being an investor. And that idea, that investment, wealth, uh, lawyers, bankers, accountants, those people are well paid. And they're well paid because they're doing what's most important in our culture, which is protecting wealth. Ideologically, wealth protects itself through the ideology of public choice economics. And I commend to you highly a book by Nancy McLean called Democracy in Chains, in which she writes about the ways in which public choice economics came to be. And one of these guys in the public choice economics journals wrote this sentence. She quotes it at the beginning of the book. The public choice revolution, that is the idea that economics is all about choices that are made, but they're really individualistic, the public choice revolution rings the death knell of the political we. Listen to that. That's what they think their economic policies do. It is the death of the political we. So growing wealth has become the goal of the, of the wealthy, and the welfare system uses the state to enrich the wealthy, even under neoliberalism the state continues to play an activist role in intervening in the economy to protect wealth. They do this through tax reform. They do this for creating new opportunities of wealth by privatizing institutions like schools or railroad systems or whatever they think they can extract some welfare, some wealth from. And they do it even at a very low level. Paige Krioski and Sass this year published a paper about the predatory care practices aimed at the poor. This is really disgusting. In the United States, as you know, people get arrested all the time, thrown in jail. And then there's an industry that's grown up to provide bail so that they don't stay in jail but can be out while they're awaiting trial. And this industry, the bail bonds industry, um, preys upon poor people. When somebody gets arrested, the bail bondsman says, I want your mother's phone number. And they call mother and they say, surely you don't want your son to be in jail for the next two months. Why don't you bail him out? Well, I don't have the money. Well, we have easy credit terms by which we can provide you with the money. And I mean, now it's just so exploitative of people at their worst moment and they use the mother's care as a way to get the money. It's, it's just a classic illustration of how predatory wealth has become. Um, at the one level, this wealth care system is chugging along, extracting more and more wealth from everywhere in the political economy they can think of. But now let's turn to part two, because one of the effects of wealth care, 
As Polanyi had told us the effect of free markets was to increase fascism, so too wealth care gives rise to what I uh, might call neo-populism. Wealth care makes people anxious. It makes them afraid of the loss of their place and status. If working as hard as you can isn't going to be able to get you a pension, um, social security, a life, if your job's going to disappear because it's cheaper for them to move it or to use technology to replace you, people are in real fear about their economic futures. And in the absence of institutions that teach people about assuming responsibility, when asked the question who to blame, um, it's easy to place blame on someone else. It's the liberals, it's the state, it's, the, it's never the wealthy people. Uh, it's those other poor people who are getting ahead of you. And the result of this is a loss of trust, loss of trust in institutions, and as long ago as Robert Putnam's work on Italy in the 1990s, we know that as people's public uh, trust de declines, so too declines social capital. This is an American story, but I hope you'll not mind listening to it. Arlie Hochschild published a remarkable book before Trump's election called Strangers in Their Own Land. And she had spent some years actually visiting people in Louisiana, which is in the American South, who are deeply Trump supporters. Um, and she went there and spoke to those folks over and over again. Although their lands were being you know, torn apart by environmental disasters, they thought the government was their enemy and no one else. They hated the people who worked for the government you know, they just sit in their air-conditioned offices all day and don't do anything. It's literally the things that they would say a hook shield. But she went back with them and, and, and wrote what she called the deep story of the way they saw the world. And she tested it out and asked them, is this what you mean? And they said yes. And so here's what she said. Um, the people were waiting in line patiently for the American dream and the line had somehow stopped moving forward. And so, as they waited patiently, they noticed that other people were getting ahead. And a lot of those people were people of color. And there was Barack Obama kind of helping them cut the queue and go to the front. That's what they saw. That's why they hate Obama so much, because he was helping the others cut the queue. Now, what's missing from this story, of course, is the wealth care piece. That the reason the line stopped, well, first of all, why are people online? Why isn't everyone equally going forward at once? Different question. But the second question, of course, is that the wealth care component is completely missing. The reason the line stopped moving forward in the first place is because of the amount of wealth generated and income generated taken by the wealthiest 10% or 1% has increased dramatically, um, and everyone else has been left to suffer. So then I want to make the argument to you that wealth care leads to this neo-populist position. Um, Right-wing neo-populism has referred to the growth of far-right politics in Europe. Oh, I'm sorry, I left out Germany. Uh, Italy, Denmark, Hungary, Poland, the Netherlands, the Trump president in the US, Brexit, Modi in India, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and so on. All over the world, this is popping up. Now, there are lots of explanations for it. There are economic arguments. Uh, probably the most popular ones at the moment are these kind of cultural arguments about cultural backlash. There are racist arguments, and they are certainly a part of this. And there are psychological arguments as well. Indeed, my colleagues in political psychology increasingly talk about this as genetic, as if it's somehow so rooted in the nature of humans that there will always be people like this. I find these arguments strange and concerning, but we'll talk about that another day. But what's really interesting to me is that the result of this neo-populism is a kind of care that I would call protectionist, following the great uh, feminist scholar Iris Young. 
It's protectionist in economic terms. They want to go back to a traditional family model. They want there not to be the disruptions of economic life. But most importantly, when you've transformed everyone into a potential competitor, you end up thinking of society as one of winners and losers. Hannah Picken, in writing about Machiavelli, in, yeah, invoked the Italian phrase furbo effeso, um, clever ones and dumb ones. And if you think everyone in the society is either clever or dumb, you certainly don't want to be the dumb one. And so you figure out that the only way for you to survive is to take advantage of others. Think of what kind of a worldview you have if the economic structures of society teach you that everybody, has, everybody is either a winner or a loser. Obviously, you want to be one of the winners, and the end result is rather frightening. It's also protectionist in security terms. These are highly masculinist. Traditional men as protectors of women, they're dangerous from outsiders. So Iris Young, in a, an essay she wrote in 2003, or actually she published in 2003, it's kind of a response to the attacks in the US in 2001, made the argument that real men are neither selfish nor do they seek to enslave or overpower others for the sake of enhancing themselves. They do it to protect those around them, especially their family. So the good man is one who keeps vigilant watch over the safety of his family and readily risks himself in the face of threats from the outside in order to protect the subordinate members of his household. Now, no, part of the deal is that the others are subordinate. So this is not new. We've seen this model of protectionism everywhere. And indeed, uh, Polanyi writes about it. But Iris Young then goes and asks the question, is this the way to run a democracy? And answers, of course, no. Through the logic of protection, the state demotes members of a democracy to dependence. When leaders promulgate fear and promise to keep us safe, they conjure up childish fantasies and desires. We are vulnerable beings, and we want very much to be made safe by, being a, by a being superior in power to all that might threaten us. I mean, that passage was written in 2002 or so, but it really reads true about what these authoritarian populist guys are doing now. Democratic citizenship, writes Young, means ultimately rejecting the hierarchy of protector and protected. I confess that I found it fascinating to go back then to Polanyi's account of fascism because he describes it almost as if it were a virus. Here's his language, in fact. A country approaching the fascist phase showed symptoms among which, isn't that interesting? He uses the language, this medical language of symptoms, um, among which the existence of a fascist movement proper was not necessarily one. At least as important signs were the spread of irrationalistic philosophies, racialist aesthetics, anti-capitalist demagoguery, heterodox currency views, criticism of the party system, widespread disparagement of the regime, or whatever was the name given to the current democratic setup. One may call it a move in preference to a movement to indicate the impersonal nature of the crisis the symptoms of which were vaguely, frequently vague and ambiguous. And I don't know where you're living, but where I'm living, we talk all the time about, is this fascist or not? People often did not feel sure a political speech or a play, a sermon or a parade was metaphysics or an artistic fashion, a poem or a party program was fascist or not. There were no accepted criteria of fascism, nor did it possess conventional tenets. Yet one significant feature of all its organized forms was the abruptness with which it appeared and faded out again, only to burst forth with violence after an indefinite period of latency. Once again, the viral metaphor here is very powerful and clear. In reality, he concluded, 
the part played by fascism was determined by one factor, the condition of the market system. And when everyone had prom been promised that the market was going to make the world better, and then it didn't, then there was this viral outbreak. So then how to respond to fascism from a care perspective, to fascism or to neo-populism or to this wealth care system that created it? I frankly think that dismissing neo-populist supporters as racists or masculinists, and et cetera, doesn't allow them to see themselves being criticized. That's not the way to go. Defeating neo-populism requires more than just a critique of neoliberal economics. It also requires addressing the racist, xenophobic, and masculinist appeals of neo-populism. But you have to do this by offering another vision of life one which is less threatening to people than neoliberalism. Although that is a very difficult thing to do, especially if everyone is afraid and no one listens to anyone else. So it's a very difficult situation to escape from. That's the happy note of part two. Part three, thinking about responsibility. So I begin by quoting this passage. I've quoted it many times because I just think it's very important here is Hannah Arendt writing in her first great book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, thinking about human rights and the universal arguments of rights. Tribalism and racism are the very realistic, if very destructive, ways of coping with this predicament of common responsibility. If we think we're responsible, then the way to avoid it is to think tribally. So another way to think about this fascist, fearful, protectionist world is to see it as an abdication of responsibility. I'll go back to Polanyi. So this is a long passage. It goes on for two more slides, I'm sorry. But the radical illusion, he says, um, is that everything is voluntary. The vision produced by the market is that everything is um, fragmented. The one derived his freedom freely from the market, the other spent it freely there. Society as a whole becomes visible. The power of the state is of no account. Um, neither voters nor owners, neither producers nor consumers could be held responsible for such brutal restrictions of freedom as were involved in the occurrence of unemployment and destitution. He's thinking of the 30s. No one is responsible. It just happened because it's the laws of economics. And if no one is responsible, any decent individual, he writes, could imagine himself free from all responsibility for acts of compulsion on the part of the state which he personally rejected or for economic suffering in society from which he personally had not benefited. He, the individual, was paying his way, was in nobody's debt, and was unentangled in the evil of power and economic value. His lack of responsibility for them seemed so evident that he denied the reality in the name of his freedom. The, I think this is a very important point that because the economy is so complex, because the activities of the wealth system are so um, nefarious and myriad, it's very easy for people to say, well, I'm not responsible for that. I didn't do that. Um, yeah. and, and if you have that, once you get to that point, it's very easy to say, well, so I have nothing to do with this. If I just take care of myself, then I've done all I need to do. After all, where does responsibility come from? And now, Polanyi has written about responsibility, I think in a very thoughtful way, but now we need to think about responsibility somewhat differently. Responsibility grows out, the very word responsibility grows out of the word response. You can't have a responsibility unless there's first been some kind of exchange. It is therefore necessarily relational. You have responsibility to something, or for something, or from something, right? That's the nature of responsibility. 
Responsibility always requires the ability or power to accomplish the ends to be achieved. If you can't do it, then you're not really responsible for it. I'm so sorry that plane crashed. Well, you know what? I didn't do it. And there's nothing I had the power to do to keep a plane from crashing. So at that level, I'm not really responsible for that. Or maybe I'm very distantly responsible for it. Um, insofar as I allowed a government to come to power that didn't regulate sufficiently, right? But it's, a, it's much more extensive than the responsibility I owe to uh, the other people in my household, right? And in care terms, one can only assume responsibility having recognized that there's a need and that someone has the capacity to address the problem. We're most familiar probably with responsibilities in terms of the kinds of institutions which we live in, our families, unions, churches, clubs, organizations where we work like hospitals and so on. So the, the term responsibility to me is, you know, I put on my political theory hat for a moment, will soon replace the idea of obligation as a way to think about how we owe to each other. And it's a much better way because it's not mechanical. It grows out of the ongoing organic processes by which we live. Margaret Walker, in her remarkable book, Moral Understandings, described an ethics of responsibility this way. An ethics of responsibility, as a normative view, would try to put people and responsibilities in the right places with respect to each other. It's a nice way to put it, isn't it? The ethics of responsibility, as a normative view, would try to put people and responsibilities in the right places with respect to each other. I've often said that I find this to be a really democratic idea, that we should spend our time thinking about where we and other people are in relation to each other and in relation to the responsibilities and that the moral part comes in when we make sure all of that is organized rightly. But if we're afraid, starting with the contagion of fascism, um, it causes people to become more wary of accepting responsibility. Since levels of responsibility have been completely broken down and we're dealing and talking about the world in these crazy, viral, abstract terms, it becomes very difficult to imagine what kind of responsibility you're actually taking on. And so what fascists do in um, Jason Stanley's remarkable book, um, How Fascism Works, he wrote about the ways in which fascists or fascist politics always have an appeal to some mythic past, which can never be achieved because it wasn't achieved in the past either, but because they are making those claims, they're able to make claims about what you should be responsible to, which is something that never existed. It is uh, what the French existentialists called an act of bad faith, but that doesn't make it any less positive and powerful. So from the right, we get these ideas about what responsibility means that are meaningless and impossible. People on the left have also pointed out that in our contemporary societies, it's very difficult to follow through your chains of responsibility and to know what responsibility means. Sheldon Wallen's book in 2008 called Democracy Incorporated uh, made the claim that the growth of large-scale economic power and the managed economy leaves people with no power and no control. And remember I said, if you don't have the power to change things, you can't really be held responsible for them. In this way, Wolin is echoing the words of the 19th century social theorist, Alexei de Tocqueville, in arguing that intermediate institutions have to be robust in order for people to have the experience of what it means to take on responsibility, to set people and responsibilities in relation to each other. But if assuming responsibility looks like a risk, it's much easier to simply deny it, to blame someone else, 
to say there's some huge conspiracy happening in pizza parlors, which is the, re the reason that Democrats have power and so on. So this third part of the paper that I've argued to you, um, that neo-populist ideas are unable to understand the nature of responsibility. So how does caring democracy get us out of this? Well, it makes things real. Care responsibilities are much closer to the actual reality of people's lives. I quote this passage from Machiavelli just because I think it's so fabulous. And men in general, more by their eyes than their hands. I'm sorry, people in general judge more by their eyes than their hands, for everyone can see, but few can feel. The distance that sight allows us to understand things is very different from the touch. It's very different from being up close enough to actually touch and see what's going on in a problem. I think there's something really important in the switch from the metaphors of vision to the metaphors of touch, uh, which are part, uh, which I think feminists have brought us to recognize. After all, people do have common experiences of responsibility and of accepting responsibility and of shirking responsibility or of passing it off on to others. Because everyone, every day in their life, cares and is cared for. And care provides us with a way of understanding and making concrete judgments about needs and a way to engage them in daily responsibilities. We are trained not to, but those things are there. It provides us with a way to, to use Danielle Allen's phrase, not Malcolm Gladwell, but Danielle Allen's phrase, talk to strangers. She defined talking to strangers as the essence of democracy. We need a political discourse, then, that builds upon this experience, this real experience people have of recognizing their responsibilities and avoiding them. And that is what carrying a democracy attempts to do. So in making responsibility more concrete, in taking care, we have to teach people that responsibilities have consequences. We have to engage more in the politics of accepting, denying, changing, judging responsibilities that occur in our everyday life, in the institutions where we work, where we live, and so on. Accepting responsibility, though, for democracy requires us to try to act more democratically. If we're going to be in a democratic society, then we should do everything in our power to reduce hierarchy, to widen power bases, to be more inclusive. And those are attitudes and qualities of care that come about when we do that, when we, in fact, engage in those kinds of activities. Well, so how do we do this? Well, there are, I guess, two steps. First, we need to call out neoliberal wealth care as the problem itself. It, it's time for us to stop letting people um, say the problem is migrants or the problem is um, we, we haven't uh, sufficient resources. We have to expose the realities of where the harms originate. First of all, the levels of inequality and this winners and losers mentality creates a situation where no one is able to make much of a, of a leap of faith to accept the risk of being more responsible. But I also want to say, this conference is organized partly around degrowth. It's insufficient for those who are well off simply to say, you know, we've, we've really got enough now, so it's time for us to just put on the brakes and stop. Because in a world that's so drastically unequal, it's a really um, self-serving thing uh, to say it's time to call off growth. We need to think really now, both at the local level, at the communal level, at the national level, and at the international level, about what kinds of growth, what kinds of care are needed for the world. And those, then we have to call those who continue to perpetuate wealth inequality to their own advantage to account. 
They have to ask people to provide living wages to workers, and maybe even to start thinking about work uh, and to start providing basic income. I, I want to go back for a second to providing living wages. There's always this talk about how high unemployment is. And um, yeah, care jobs are going begging everywhere in the advanced world, in, in the uh, industrialized first world, high income countries. Um, lots of workers are being ex imported from the rest of the world to do that work. Why? Is it, it, there are nobody's there to do the work? Well, the unemployment rate in many European countries is very high right now. And yet still these jobs are being filled by migrant workers. It would be possible to change the way in which we think about care work, for example, to improve dramatically the way in which uh, unemployment and employment works in these so-called um, higher income nations. But then the second thing we have to do, and the final thing I'll say, is we have to enact forms of caring democracy. We have to envision ways that public policies and institutions can strengthen rather than weaken the ways to care for people and the environment. Let me just mention a few of these. I mean, there's so much going on actually right now in the world of research about care, and it is going on everywhere in the world that it's important to talk about this. First of all, time use st studies, uh, for those example in Latin America, measure the amount of time that people do unpaid work compare it to paid work and ask the question, how are we ever going to equalize these? And although it's very, to, you know, I'm a political theorist, what do I know? Karina uh, Patignani from Uruguay is here in the front and uh, does this work. The time use studies demonstrate how much unpaid work there is in the world. We could think differently about that work and it would re result in a huge change in social structure. Feminists have begun to talk about economic changes that would make care more central. Here in Germany, there's a group called Care Revolution that you might be familiar with, familiar with sorry. Um, Schilberg at, in Germany has also been arguing for some time for a care economy. Ipec, Ilika Karen has been making an argument for a purple economy to go along with the green economy, which would measure and take account of care work as well. Um, it may be possible for us as we use environmental impact statements to measure whether or not a given project of development hurts the earth or helps it. It might be possible also to create care impact statements. What would it mean for people's care lives if we change institution X this way or that way. Jennifer Nadelsky and Tom Mallison have been working on a book for some years called Part-Time for All, in which they argue that no one should be allowed to work as many hours as people often do in the advanced world. And we should also note and take advantage of welcoming communities. At this point, I would normally talk about Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, which is a little village in Minnesota where um, Hispanic and African peoples began to show up in this predominantly Norwegian, Swedish immigrant community. And at first, there was a lot of violence and unhappiness. And then some people in the community said, no, no, this isn't going to be the way we're going to do this. We're going to organize to make the new people feel welcome, to make the old people continue to feel that they are valued. But in the New York Times this week, the picture over there, um, there's a little town in northern, northeastern Germany, almost all the way to the Polish border, where there weren't enough children for the elementary school to continue having a first grade. And so the mayor invited nine Syrian families to come settle in the town. And now there's, a, there's an elementary school, there's a community, people bring sweets from Syria as well as apple cakes to Oktoberfest. It's just been a few years, but people have been integrated into the community rather well. It's true, a, third, a quarter of the people in the town still vote for the AF day, but um, on the other hand, there are also new ways in which the other have been incorporated in, in a way that's not frightening. And finally, the state needs to turn its interest from wealth care to people care. The supportive state, 
not in any state, but state that provides for people to have the ways to be able to live their lives so that they can care for others. That's what we need. Freedom, to go back to the beginning, freedom doesn't come from the absence of responsibility. It comes from having responsibilities which are properly set and in which everybody is sharing. Thank you.